Let's open up our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. And uh, during the time I've been sick, I've always prepared my sermons and uh, had them ready, even though I, if I couldn't be here, I wanted to have a sermon to feed my own heart. So I've got a bunch of sermons that I've got laid up because of being away, and I do appreciate Brother Philip and Brother Hart, and those that filled in and helped me uh, during that time. Uh, you know, we're all human, and, and uh, sickness can come, and uh, when it does, we just have to uh, trust God, try to seek medical help. I, I'm doing much better with my blood sugar. I'm finally getting it down under 200, and uh, my feet are feeling better. Uh, I'm on this uh, Ozemp Ozempic, and uh, I take a shot once a week, and with uh, the Ozempic and my diet, and I take metformin, uh, have to try to eat, you know, everything baked and uh, things that are not fatty. And uh, but uh, my my body feels so much better now that I've got my sugar down. My sugar must have been sky high uh, because my feet would hurt so bad, and I I couldn't feel. It. There's numbness and then pain. It's kind of hard to describe, but I know some of you have uh, had some of that, and you know what it's like. But uh, thank God for His healing hand and for wisdom. John chapter 16, and uh, we're going to uh, be reading there. And verse 1 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Uh, one, of the, one of the easiest things in life is to get offended. And that word offended uh, means that you get uh, into a situation spiritually uh, where you stumble. Uh, to a, the, the literal Greek word offend uh, carries with it the idea of making to stumble. And uh, we, we might, you know, get offended at something and let it affect us in such a way that uh, it causes us to stumble. And we don't act in a Christian way, or we, you know, we, we lose our temper. Or we, you know, we have things that really try us. Uh, th there's been things happened in our lives that we never dreamed would happen. You know, uh, you, you have a child, uh, a young girl, your, your daughter, sexually violated, uh, basically raped, and you know, you go through something like that, and uh, I would always say that if anybody ever uh, did that to my daughter, that I would kill them, and I really meant it, and when it happened, I went over to my farm, had my shotgun, and I was planning uh, how I was going to take this boy's life. I know I was wrong, but I was so hurt and offended that what he had done uh, to my daughter. And the uh, law wasn't going to do anything. And she was underage. And, um, but the Lord ministered to me and uh, showed me that I didn't need to do that, that I need to love this boy. So I called him on the phone, and I told him I loved him. And I said... What you've done to me, I hope never happens to you if you have a daughter. But I said, if you'll go to church faithfully for a month and you'll read your Bible, I said, uh, I, won't, I won't take this to court. And if you'll apologize to her. And so he did, and he went to church. And then not much long, longer after that, he was killed in a car wreck. 
But, you know, we go through things in our life that we never think would happen. And they do, and when they do, uh, for a little bit we may, we may not understand it right. And our, our flesh can get the best of us. So, you know, we were, we were talking about, uh, I saw this thing on one of the uh, 2020 or something like that, and this beautiful young lady was uh, dismembered, and murdered by this uh, creepy person who uh, just simply was, was eavesdropping on her, and then he just murdered her and uh, cut her body up and did that sort of thing. And I thought, Lord, I don't know how a mother and dad would deal with that. You know, it would make you want to go and, and, and take that person out for doing that kind of thing. But then you hear the parents say, I've already forgiven them, and uh, they're in God's hands. And that's really the only way that you can deal with these things is through the love of God and realize that uh, there, there's things sometimes out of our control. We, we cannot change it, but God has a purpose. So Jesus had spoken to them about all sorts of different things that were going to happen, and He said, I've spoken this that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Because you see, people who act in such a way, they don't know what love is. They don't know, uh, you know, how that uh, God's love is so... Uh, strong and influential in our lives. But he said, These things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said un not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. And I think that was a normal uh, thing to do uh, when the Lord told them that He was going to leave them. You know, they had different responses, and some said, well, Lord, you know, we want you here. We want to talk to you. We want to understand what's going on. We need you. And the Lord said, but I'm going to go. I have to go. And I'm going to ascend to the Father, but I'm going to give you a comforter. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and He's going to comfort your heart. Now they go on, and He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Just as Jesus had to go away, there's an appointed time when all of us have to go away. Uh, you know, I've lost several loved ones in my life, and it's a, it's a hard thing, uh, but God's grace gets you through it. And, uh, you know, there are times that I think about my mom and dad, and I just wish that I could be with them. Uh, I've gone back on all my old phones and, tried to find a message from my mom or my dad uh, just to hear their voice. Uh, and I know that when, when we lose a loved one, our hearts are saddened, but uh, we have to go. There's a better place prepared. And the Bible tells us that He said, uh, when He has come, verse 8, He will reprove the world of sin, judgment, righteousness and judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more that is he was going to go to the father and his death on the cross and his burial and resurrection is what brought us righteousness and by going to the father uh, many believe that Jesus made a sacrifice of himself to the Father 
uh, brought the fruits of what had been accomplished and there before God on the throne of the altar he made the sacrifice that brought us salvation uh, however that was done uh, God did it perfectly of judgment because the prince of this world is judged that is the devil Satan he's judged uh, he's already been judged in one sense when Jesus defeated him at the cross and uh, he's been cast down uh, so we understand that uh, he did not have, he does not have the same standing with God uh, as he did before Christ died. After Christ died, his station in life changed. Even though he's not omnipresent, he's not omniscient, Satan can only be one place at a time, but he's been cast down. And uh, he does not have the power that he once had because that power has been limited. He goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But uh, I believe it was Spurgeon and John Gill, they both used the illustration of a vicious dog that uh, is running loose in the yard and then the owner puts a chain and a collar on it so that he is restrained. And I believe the same is true with the devil. He's been restrained uh, so that the gospel might go forth. I mean, when you stop and think about how many people are Christians uh, who do believe that Christ died on the cross for their sins and that He arose from the dead, there are a lot of Christians in the world today. Kathy was reading an article about this Justin Beaver uh, as an entertainer. I don't know if any of you have read his testimony that he wrote lately, but uh, evidently the Lord has saved him. And he was telling about how the only thing he cares about in life is that he walk with Christ and find the peace and joy of the Lord. Uh, I don't think that he was faking that. I mean, there were some things he wrote that really made you believe that he, he got saved. Uh, <clears throat> many people are the Lord saving, and, uh, you know, I never thought my dad would get saved. When I first got saved, he mocked me and uh, made fun of me and made fun of my preacher. You know, he wouldn't let the preacher come and talk to him. And uh, Then one day, God dealt with his heart, and my dad only had one leg. And when he got saved, I watched him walk. He was about like where Brother Osborne is. He got up and made his way with his wooden leg, came up front, and he said, Today the Lord saved me. And uh, I tell you, I was, I was so happy. That the Lord saved my dad. And you know, when, when somebody gets saved, uh, the angels rejoice in heaven. We should too, to see somebody saved. Jesus goes on and says, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whosoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me. Now, there's a lot of folks in these Pentecostal churches, and uh, all they do is they glorify the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you something. Uh, there's no place in the Bible where we're told to pray to the Holy Spirit. We once had a, a youth outing with Ashland Avenue. This was years ago. And we took some of our young people and this young man led in prayer and he prayed to the Holy Spirit. The whole prayer, he prayed to the Holy Spirit. And even when he ended, he prayed in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I... I said something to him. I said, listen, what you did is not biblical. Uh, you don't pray to the Holy Spirit. You pray to the Father. We're taught that in the model prayer. Jesus said, when you pray, you go and you say, 
My Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of the epistles, we're, we're told to pray in the name of Jesus and address the Father. And uh, anyway, he, he says the Holy Spirit's going to glorify me. I grew up in a holiness church. And we went about every week, and uh, uh, people would just be kind of like this, and all of a sudden somebody just jump up and start shouting, and they'd run around the church, you know, they'd be, uh, and, and I'd sit there and I'd think, what in the world's wrong with that person? And uh, we even had one one man one time had a, had these old overalls on, and he was jumping up, and his overalls popped. And down they went to his knees, and he fell into a heating stove with both hands. And uh, uh, his wife came up and helped him get his overalls up. And I'll never forget, he had polka dotted, <laughs> polka dotted boxers on and long johns. But, uh, you know, some of the things that I witnessed, I know they were sincere, and I know they believed it. But they were, they were not, they didn't understand the Holy Spirit does not want to be glorified. He wants the Son to get all glory. And uh, this, is, this is why we don't pray to the Holy Spirit or uh, want to somehow go around the Father and we don't want to pray in the name of Jesus. Now, you know, sometimes they'll have a prayer and uh, they'll pray this long prayer and then they'll get to the end and they'll say amen and they don't pray in Jesus name when people do that I don't have one bit of respect for that kind of prayer because that prayer could go to the devil that prayer could go to any God you name but when you pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ you are saying he is the Redeemer, and He's my Savior. I know people don't want to offend others, but uh, I, had a, I was invited to speak at this big uh, breakfast thing years ago, and they wanted me to pray. And uh, this guy that was kind of leading it, he was saying, now, at the end, you just need to say Amen. And I said, look, I'm not praying a prayer without praying in the name of Jesus. And when I got up in front of this big crowd, I prayed. And uh, at the end, I, I stopped and I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you could just hear, you could just hear this like, <gasps> you know, what? But uh, if we don't do that, I don't think we really pray. And then he says, He shall glorify me, he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while, and you shall not see me. And again a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. So he's saying, I'm going to be taken up, I'm going to ascend, and a little while will pass, and you're going to see me again. And we're going to see him again if we're alive when he comes. Wouldn't that be a glorious thing? I mean, could happen any day. Uh, could happen even now while we're here. The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now as, as I come to the close, we're going to have to skip on a little bit. I want to go to verse 33. Uh, I, I, I wish we could go through all of this, but the Lord led me uh, to say what I, I have to say. Verse 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be happy. Uh, I, I was trying my best to be happy this morning, but the pain kind of 
uh, hindered my face, I guess, from uh, showing that joy. But oh, I have joy. Listen, I have joy because I'm going to heaven. And uh, because I know Christ, there's a joy in my heart that I can't explain. And no matter how bad it gets, that joy comes out, don't it? And then Jesus says, be of good cheer. Why? I've overcome the world. Oh, what good news. I have overcome the world. At a glance, we look at these words that Jesus uses. and We think, well, he, he was meek and lowly. Remember Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Another place He told the disciples, He said, uh, If you follow me, uh, you're going to see that I am meek and lowly in heart. And He was. But yet, He was the conqueror. We imagine different people like Caesar, Alexander the Great, even you think of, of Hitler. And we don't approve of Hitler and what he, what he did, but you know, you read a little bit about uh, the things that he accomplished in the flesh. And uh, it was incredible that a, that a man could do such things. Uh, but I think Satan was working behind him. Here was a, a man from Galilee. Uh, he didn't wear fancy clothes. He didn't have the luxuries of the world. He was homeless. Uh, Jesus had no home as far as going somewhere where he could lay down. He just slept in the garden or wherever he went, and the disciples would be with him, and they would just find a place. Sometimes they'd know someone. But here he was in this condition. He was mocked by the soldiers. Uh, they shamefully treated him. Uh, they brought him out and made a public example of his execution. Yet never did anyone speak more truly than Jesus when Jesus said, Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He spoke not after the manner of the flesh, but the victory over a moral and spiritual world of evil. Brothers and sisters, there, are, there is evil in this world. It is all around us. And all it takes is, you know, being in the wrong place at the wrong time where different people don't care who they hurt. Uh, some of the big cities of America, uh, they say that if you even make a wrong turn into a certain community, that you'll never get out of there because they'll shoot you and kill you, rob you of everything you have. It's a, it's a wicked world that we live in. When you think about what, what people will do to other people, you know, I, I don't want to see anybody hurt. I don't want to hurt nobody in the world. I don't want them to have pain. But there are people who are so sadistic that they will get pleasure from seeing someone uh, have a leg amputated or, or cutting your eye out. I mean, it's just horrible the things they do. And then you think about what these men want to do to little children. You know, take a little innocent child and then kill that child and get joy from that. I don't understand that. That is wicked. I mean, that is sinful. And the things that we read about and hear of in the world, you know, it's not a joke. It's real. That's why we have prisons. That's why we have jails because there are people who do not need to be out in society. But we know that Jesus has overcome the world and brought us victory. Jesus is 
Listen, Jesus is the greatest conqueror in all of history. There has never, nor will there ever, be any conqueror that even can touch the hem of his garment. When I was in school, I was always infatuated with Alexander the Great because of how he loved horses and uh, how he trained his men and conquered the known world uh, when he was in his early 30s. And I, I read a lot about him and wrote papers about Alexander the Great. And then I found out about some of his immoral practices, about his, his homosexuality and just all sorts of wickedness that he was involved in. Uh, he was not a good man. He was a wicked man, but he was a conqueror of the world. We see lots of people in the world that have evil intentions. And we should not be that way because Christ has overcome the world. This world is this present system, the order of things which prevails throughout the human race due to the sin of man and the powerful influence of Satan, who the Bible calls, and Jesus said, is the prince of this world. Brother Philip taught about this this morning in Sunday school. I almost uh, thought he was going to preach my old sermon, but uh, this system of the world is what Christ is referring to. The sum of all possessions, powers, pleasures, which the earthly life offers, organized under the influence of Satan, so to leave God out and oppose His sovereignty and keep the heart of man bound to these wicked things. As a child of God, we turn away from that. We turn away from sin and ungodliness. And we keep ourselves unspotted from this world. And if we don't, we're not going to have the proper fellowship with God because there will be a break in that fellowship because of our sins. But Jesus wants us to know He's overcome the world. And if we repent and receive Him into our heart and lives, He will bring us incredible peace. He has... Uh, defeated the enemy who has pushed God out. You know, in, in our public schools, uh, thank God not all of them are like this, especially more of your uh, country schools. Uh, they pray, they even read the Bible and do stuff, but then you'll have some liberal come in there and they'll they'll hear about them, you know, praying in the name of Jesus and they want to try and stop it and they threaten to sue them and all that. Because you see, the world doesn't want God in, in its system because it has to be submissive. When God says that a man is to love his wife and be faithful and that a wife is to be faithful to her husband, you see, the world don't want that. Ungodly men want to cheat on their wives. They want to have a wife and then two or three mistresses. And, and they want to live their wild life. And, but eventually what happens, it catches up. And then the, this, this mountain they've built of sin comes crashing down upon their lives. Oh, I've seen it. And I know you have. Because Jesus will not allow that stuff to continue. He will bring it down. So far as the world is concerned, the world is anything that shuts God out. Uh, I was reading uh, in a commentary, pulpit commentary, and it described the world as anything that shuts God out. Well, we don't want to have prayer because somebody will get offended. We don't want to do this or we don't want to do that. Uh, they were talking about a little baby that was born on leap year uh, well, yesterday uh, or maybe the day before, I can't remember. 
but they were talking about this little baby born and and the parents said that the Lord blessed them and was talking about all the things that the Lord had done. And then I think it was on what WKYT, and then the man that was doing the story said, and the Lord blessed them and gave them this child. And I thought, wow, I looked over at Kathy and I said, did you hear that? They, they gave the Lord credit and, and here on television with no doubt hundreds of thousands of people, they gave God credit. Oh, I love that. I, I, I once, when I was in my 30s, wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, I don't know, so I just got this feeling. I want to be an astronaut and I want to get on the uh, spaceship and get up in space and preach the gospel. And that way I could preach the gospel to everybody in the world. Uh, but it never happened. <laughs> I never got to be an astronaut, but uh, I dreamed of doing that. Anything that shuts God out, if we would know whether a thing is of the world or not, all you got to ask is, does it shut God out? And if it does, it's secular. It's of the world. And uh, I was somewhere uh, around a bunch of people and I was uh, talking about the Lord and uh, said something out loud for everybody to hear and somebody behind me said, you're not supposed to be talking like that in public. And I said, why not? And he said, well, that stuff is uh, to be at home or in your church. And I said, listen, Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it's not against God's truth to speak up and and talk about the Lord. Ah, It's a glorious thing. As individuals, the world is that present, consistent sea of things which surrounds us. It's customs. It's fashions. It's maxims. It's rules. It's modes. It's manners. It's forces. You know, when you when you grow up in the world, your family has traditions, certain things. In my family, uh, there was some things that I would call witchcraft that my mom practiced that was passed down from her mom. And uh, she thought she could tell the future. She went through this for a few years. She had a crystal ball and... Uh, She'd have seances and all that kind of thing. And I'd just stand back and, and she'd go out and build a big fire. Everybody would come and uh, I'd, I'd stand back and I'd think, what in the world are they doing? You know, this is, this is crazy. And then later on when I got saved, I told my mom, I said, you know, that was wicked, Mom. It's a wonder God didn't kill you for doing those kind of things. But you see, uh, people... Where they grow up, they get these customs and these traditions and these ideas, and they think, well, sin is nothing. It's just, you know, just go ahead and kill a little baby. Uh, uh, You know, I I can't believe that half of our nation is so blind that they support men and women who believe in eradicating babies in the mother's womb. That is the highest... A demonstration of taking the rights of another that you can find. And everybody says, oh, we're for equal rights. Well, what about that little baby in the womb? Does it not have rights? Does it not have the opportunity to live and to breathe and to grow? I'll tell you this, I will not vote for a person that is pro-choice. I won't do it. People can call me what they want, but uh, first thing I do when I look at somebody that's running for office, are they against abortion or are they for it? I didn't vote for our present governor because he believes in abortion. Brashear and his dad are both liberals. They claim to be Baptist, but they believe in killing children. Now folks, that's just what it is. You can try to cover it up, 
But when a woman goes in and has an abortion and takes the life of a child, don't tell me that God is not watching. He is. We shut God out. There's much of good everywhere around us now. You know, there are good people in the world. There are godly people. Uh, even doctors, we find uh, a doctor and he prayed. Uh, I forget who it was, but he, yeah, with Amy, and he come in, he prayed, and he prayed in Jesus' name. And boy, I thought that's great. I was somewhere uh, visiting the hospital, and this doctor was there, and he prayed for the patient before the surgery and prayed in Jesus' name. Uh, I think the doctor even prayed with me uh, when I had a colonoscopy or something. But uh, that's a great thing. There, I'm not saying that everybody in the world is evil. That God has people, saints, that are out there. And we find them and they're a blessing to our lives.